Welcome. Welcome, guys. Just making sure, giving some opportunity for more to hop in. All right, so it's 105, and I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome. Thanks for coming to our second mastery series. We are super excited to have you. Um, my name, for those of you who haven't been introduced to me yet, is Carmen Marie, and I'm the director of marketing at SmileSnap. Um, and as someone whose career is focused around digital marketing and driving leads and conversions, I was really excited when the opportunity presented itself to host a webinar in collaboration with People in Practice. Um, you know, we're really excited to have them. So, you know, as you guys know, virtual consultations and teledental software is becoming integral in the future of dentistry and orthodontics. And in the words of Dr. Waldman, these tools are not magic buttons though. Um, as an insider at SmileSnap, we've seen some pretty compelling data on how practices are growing their new patient leads by both increasing their virtual consultation conversion rate and driving more users into the opening of the funnel. So I think you'll find today's presentation pretty compelling. Um, before we get started, I kind of wanted to just explain some of the uh, webinar and Zoom features that we have. Um, so, as you guys can see the little icons there, there are a few unique features um, that we're gonna be using today to provide you the best experience. So let me explain those. The Q&A feature allows you to submit questions about the content that is being covered. So if anything is unclear or you have um, some follow-up questions, please feel free to answer, enter your question there and um, either myself or Dave from SmileSnap will be answering those. Um, and the next we have the polling feature. So I will be launching a poll or two, um, which is going to allow us to gauge uh, your feedback and just get information from, from you guys uh, to help guide our presentation. And then lastly, we have the chat feature. Um, and this is for you to use throughout the entire presentation. Uh, just make sure that when you use the chat button that you click to all panelists and to all attendees. Uh, this gives you a more open forum and allows you to interact with not just the panelists, but all the attendees as well. Um, so yeah, and then we will have some question time at the end. So I will either keep some of your questions for after the presentation, or I will um, interject some that I think are going to help um, add you know, some good conversation to, to the presentation itself. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our host today, uh, Dr. Leon Klempner um, and Amy of People in Practice. So Thank welcome. you. Thank yeah. you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. I'm particularly excited to be here because of my relationship with Greg at SmileSnap. I knew Greg way before, uh, you know, the smile, sca smile Snap became a reality and, uh, you know, people in practice and Smile Snap have a lot uh, in common in terms of looking to start new patients for, for our clients. A little bit background about myself. I'm one of you. I practiced for 40 years on Long Island, went to Maryland, went to Tufts, teaching now at Harvard, love the blues, and I love technology. And I'm joined today with my co-host and my lovely daughter, Amy Epstein. Hi there, Amy Epstein here. Um, so my dad and I are in business together here, but what he brings to the table in orthodontic experience, I bring in marketing and uh, agency management experience. So I spent a long time um, working in the agency world, doing marketing, digital marketing for large brands, global brands. Um, and so I have a marketing degree, a bachelor's degree and an MBA. And my fun fact is that I play the cello. And to be truthful here, the last time I believe you played the cello was spring concert in high school. Yeah, that could be about right. Yeah. I said, I don't have a fun fact. He said, you have fun facts. How about this? How about that? And they're not really fun. I said, my fun fact is that I'm, I have no, I'm not fun. That's no, my it's fun not, fact. Not true. It's <laughs> not true. It's not true. So people in practice, uh, the story is simple. Um, I had two offices on Long Island, probably one of the most competitive demographics in the country. And all of a sudden, GPs, my GP referral numbers started to decline. Um, smile, uh, six month smile, um, Invisalign, fast smiles, all of a sudden GPs began doing their own ortho. Uh, 
the, our strong pedo referrals began bringing in orthos and as a result i needed to replace them so um i asked my daughter who has her mba in marketing i don't know how much how much did i spend on that uh tuition don't ask okay anyway so she came and she uh you know, gave me some advice. And we began working together. And all of a sudden, my numbers started going up. And in fact, uh, by the time I was done, my numbers tripled. And colleagues of mine began asking, well, what are you doing on Facebook? Why are you, you know, what's the story they didn't quite understand it. And they asked for help and ultimately, uh, the birth of people in practice. So that's our story. We that is our story. Um, we want to take a quick poll, uh, just to get a sense of who in the audience, um, who's in the audience. And so if you wouldn't mind just, um, answering now, if you're currently using internet marketing to drive new patients, um, to virtual consultations, we'd like to know that. So just take a moment to click yes or no. And I think the answer to that poll is okay. We have 68% of our participants who are currently using internet marketing to drive new patients. So that's great. Um, and, and 32 who don't, which is also helpful to know. So we'll, we'll try to, uh, target our presentation both ways. Yeah. So hopefully we're preaching to the choir when we, we discuss some of these issues and, and for those that are already um, leveraging uh, virtual consults. We hope to give you some really good takeaway tips. And for those that aren't, we hope to open your eyes a little bit about the opportunities that exist because the opportunities do exist. Um, why virtual consults? Well, just look at the demographics. The, the group that you will be treating in your career is different than the group I treated in my career. Digital natives, millennials and Gen Z, they act differently. They work differently. They communicate differently. They are in different places. And if you're not there, then you are losing a huge opportunity. Not to mention the tremendous demand for straight teeth that's out there right now. And I don't want to mention the names, Big Purple, but they spent $300 million. In that was subtle, by the way. <laughs> I mean, Big Purple could be a lot of different things. Yes. I don't want to get sued either. but. $300 million in ad spend is a lot of money. Uh, and, and it's out there generating a desire to get your teeth straight. And we're orthodontists. We can capitalize on that opportunity. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, those that are slow to coming to virtual consults and the people in practice, we've been um, moving our practices there over the last couple of years. Um, but for those of you that have just started using it because of the necessity during this crisis, think about what the new normal is going to look like and the opportunity to decrease the, um, the traffic through your office. Uh, uh, not, not that we're eliminating physical consults, but we can minimize some of the uh, traffic coming through that aren't that interested. Um, and, and to that point, um, we can answer questions uh, such as common ones regarding price range and, and kind of weed out people that really are not looking, not, not serious about coming in for that physical exam and records that are required in order to get going. So we, we have a lot of our clients now that have had a taste of this and are streamlining, want to use virtual consults more just to streamline their workflow. So today we're going to talk about three essential elements, all three, you need all three, and this is critical. Um, one is you need an optimized website, not just a website, an optimized website. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Uh, secondly, you need a virtual consult widget. You need a, a, a call to action that speaks in the language of the people that you're looking to attract. And thirdly, you need the engine that drives people to it, which is internet, digital, social marketing. And we'll go into detail on all three of those. But let's take a quick look at data because we collect a lot of data. I, I know SmileSnap collects a lot of data. 
So we have about 100 practices, 100 offices out there that, that we can get a sense of what's going on. But if you, if you go ahead and Google um, what the conversion rate for a typical healthcare website, and you'll find that it's at less than 3%, 2.9, 2.5, 2.7, the numbers vary, but pretty low. Uh, adding SmileSnap to your website, um, just putting the widget there and giving people an opportunity to come will increase it to 4.5%. And guess what? Um, when SmileSnap shared some of these numbers with us, their top 20% of, of their practices, the top 20% are converting at 9% because they are leveraging all three of what we're gonna be talking about today. So. For the same number of web visitors, you'll get at least three times as many web conversions. And when you think about pay-per-click and other expenses, uh, there's considerable savings there. Dale Davis, orthodontist in, in Midland, Michigan, been a client of people in practice for a while, now a client of SmileSnap as well. This is a quote, in the middle of the pandemic, we started virtual consultations allowed us to increase production during the downtime. Virtual consults are effective and they're here to say, stay. And I hear this from a lot of our clients. So what's the agenda? Here's the goal. Our goal is to give you concrete tools and a true understanding of the interrelationship of why you need these three critical components in order to leverage um, the, uh, the audience that you're looking to attract to replace the GPs and the pedos. There's a certain percentage of practices that can survive on professional referrals, a multidisciplinary a practice, a practice focusing exclusively on clefts or on, on orthognathic surgery. Um, yes, those practices can deal without um, replacing them, but for the most part, most of us are gonna need a new source, and this is a tremendous opportunity. Um, and as a bonus, at the end of the webinar, we'll provide some special offers for you. So let's start number one, website. Everybody has a website, right? And when I got my website, what was I interested in? I wanna know how it looks. I wanna know what color it is. I want it to look pretty. I mean, is that really what we want a website for? Is that really you know, the, the end goal? Um, in our eyes, and again, we're marketers, but you know, as an orthodontist, I'm expecting my website to produce for me. And if it's not producing, I, I need to figure out why. So it's not just the color and the design of a website. There are certain things that you can do. And we'll go through this website audit and um, uh, hit some of the common things that I'm seeing on ortho websites that at, um, work and some that don't work. Um, the user interface, the UI, most of you have that covered, meaning that it's functional. You click on it, you get the information. You know, it's a calling card. It, it gives you the uh, telephone number, it gives you the email address, it gives you the directions, contact us, et cetera. But in, in reality, you know, filling out for, for a digital native to come to a website and go ahead and fill out a form, um, that doesn't work all that well. The UX or the user experience is what we're going to concentrate on here. What do we want it to do and how can we set it up so it does that? So let's take a look at, at number one. Um, we need to lead them if we want them to go to the virtual consult. And what I'm seeing is I'm seeing call to actions all over the place. I'm seeing, um, you know, click here for virtual consult and click here for uh, an appointment, fill out the form. Click here to call our office. Click here to, to learn about, about the, yeah, to, to chat with us. Right. Click here for, and to learn more, more about Invisalign. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's particularly uh, concerning too, if you think about, um, you know, it might at first look okay, maybe if you have a few on your, when you're looking at it on a desktop, we would argue that's not a good idea, but you might think, okay, well, I want all those things there, but then go ahead and ping the site on mobile and likely only one is going to take over most of the real estate of the site on a mobile device. So you're not even getting the benefit of, of the you know, different channels. So you're, you're best off sticking with one call to action and that's for the virtual consult. 
Yeah. And sometimes on mobile, I've seen like the call to action that you don't want take up the most real estate yeah, exactly. and, and, you know, like eat up all of the area. Right. So, you know, we need to lead them. Also, we need the call to action on every lead page, every page that you want them to come for virtual consult, have it there. It's not enough to just have it, you know, on the home page itself. Uh, you want it to stand out. You want a, some sort of contrasting color. You don't want it to just blend in because they won't look at it. Uh, simple things like the wording of it can make a difference. When we do this, this collective data, we find that if you ask them for, you know, to, to start a virtual consult, it doesn't work as well as if we ask them to start your free virtual consult. A free virtual consult versus your free virtual consult makes a difference. What about when they go onto your website? Again, there's something called a bounce rate. We don't have time to go over a lot of things, but you've got about eight seconds to grab their attention. You know, new patients don't have a lot of patients. They go on there and it's not- yeah. New patients don't have a lot of patients. Right. I like that. Right. We're gonna close with that. <laughs> yeah, it was intentional too. Uh -huh. um, Anyway, now nah, I threw me off. I'm sorry. All right. They don't have a, not, a lot of patients. So you have about eight seconds right. to grab their attention before they're out of there. That's right. And, and, and what about like, when you look at design, everybody wants video. We want a lot of video that, that could clunk up your site. And, and when you, when somebody clicks on it, a one second load delay can lower your conversion by 7%. So, you know, you want it clean, you want it neat. Uh, you want it contemporary, but be aware of, of overloading it with too much stuff. Um, also, targeted pages. Um, if you're going to send somebody to the website for a virtual consult, it's useful to have information about what, a, what your virtual consult is. So send them to a page, a landing page, or a blog page, or something that tells about it so that you can kind of warm them up and lead them along. Um, and then the last one, and again, you know, if you're as old as I am, you know what above the fold is. We should do a survey of, you know, what above the fold means. Well, they know from a website <laughs> perspective, they know, but well, not from a newspaper perspective. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah. Anyway, have your call to action above the fold. Above the fold, you know, for those of you that are digital natives, <laughs> they, they were, at one point in time, there used to be something called a newspaper. And people got information from their newspaper. And, you know, you would fold the newspaper and read it when you're on the subway. And um, you rarely would flip it over. And in, in digital language, that means don't, you, don't, you don't want your new patients to scroll down beyond what shows up initially as the call to action. So now we'll ask Carmen Marie to, to come back in and help us with this open discussion. Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, let's see here. Yeah. So we kind of just wanted to get some feedback from you guys and, um, you know, ask Yes, question. So do you know what the most valuable conversion tool on your website is um, for you personally? So feel free to answer that in the chat. Um, that's where Dave and I are kind of hanging out, talking to some of you um, or in the Q&A. So yeah, some of those could be a request of uh, consult forms, phone number, virtual consultation tool or widget, calendar scheduling tool. We'd love to hear from you. So. Yep. And here's a hint. This is this webinar sponsored by SmileSnap. <laughs> Don't advance it yet until we get the poll results. No, we're, no, it's going to the chat. Oh, it's going to, sorry. It's going, it's to, going the to the chat. chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Chat. What about the widget? Okay. There are things you can do just because you have it doesn't mean that you're going to start a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, and get, you're going to get a lot of engagement in, into it. You need to pay attention to certain things about it. So what are some of the best practices? What are some of, of the things that, that people are getting good results are doing? Well, number one, they're putting it on not only the home page, as we said before, they're putting it on every page. And guess what? If you put it on the bottom left for us, those of you that are listening that speak English, we read from left to right. So if you put it on the bottom left, statistically, it it does better than if you put it on the bottom right. Um, also, uh, you want to set it up so that it opens up automatically if you can, uh, particularly if for repeat visitors. So when they come back again, these are kind of like warm leads if they're coming back to your website. And I think that, uh, that SmileSnap has figured out a way that they could, they could determine if somebody's a repeat visitor. Um, and, and if so, ask them to turn that function on for you because it makes a difference. 
And then lastly, when you configure your questions and, and, and in a customizable widget, um, keep it to a minimum. Don't put a lot of questions. Um, the fewer the questions, statistically, the better the response. And the last piece of the puzzle is we need to feed the funnel. The more that goes in on the top, the more that will come out on the bottom. So having the website and having the call to action virtual widget on your page doesn't mean that people are going to click on it. You know, maybe if they trip on it or find it, they will, but that, we don't want to count on that. There are ways that we can drive people that would be interested right to it. And I'm going to let Amy talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, I mean, as with any website or anything on a website, um, just because you build it doesn't mean they will come. Um, and so that's why we're digital marketing tools are even here. So, you know, what you're looking at now is our perspective on the, what we call the network of touch points. Everything out there, whether it's digital or not, that impacts the people coming to your website to check you out and to submit a request uh, for an appointment or, or do a virtual consultation or ask for a virtual consultation. So that, you know, dentist referrals, they're still there and they're still strong when they're there. Um, staff is important. We don't want to discount the, per, you know, the community involvement that the staff has. And patient to patient referrals are also very strong. We know those things. Um, but what we really want to focus out, oh, and one, one quick thing is that you'll see that there are, are people here and depending on who you are, uh, whether you're a Gen Xer, a Gen Zer, um, you might come into this network from a different uh, touch point. So this uh, gentleman might come in through a social ad, whereas the millennial might maybe do a Google search first or check out public reviews, then you know, check out a couple more things and ultimately um, visit the website to submit um, there for a virtual consultation. So what we're going to focus on, however, is the digital elements that are in this network, the social ads, the social media, Google search, and public reviews, which are really the four strong components of a marketing program for orthodontics, orthodontists. Um, and so, and in, if you are activating on all of these touch points, you're driving from multiple different hubs to one main area for them to submit a virtual appointment. So if you can think about it as catching them in this web in all of these different ways and then driving them toward one central location to submit their, their virtual consult. So let's talk a little bit about the first element, uh, which is digital advertising. And from our perspective, um, there are two pieces of that puzzle, the yin and the yang um, of digital ads are the Facebook, which also comprises Instagram. There are other digital advertising platforms as well, but Facebook and Instagram are really dominant. Um, and then there's Google. So as we're Facebook, you are choosing the people you'd like to see your ads. Google relies on people who are actively searching on certain keywords and you want to make sure you're there when they do. So push and a pull. So when, you, when we think about the Google and, the, and Facebook for, um, for advertising, with Facebook, we have a little slightly more flexibility in that we can educate our target audience of local prospective new patients, as well as present them with ads that are more targeted at getting them to submit a form on the, on the virtual consultation widget or submit their information there. Whereas Google is really the latter only. There isn't much opportunity for education and awareness uh, on Google. So we'll talk about Facebook a little bit first on its ads platform. So the first thing to keep in mind about Facebook advertising is that you want the page that you're driving them to from the ad they see on Facebook to match. So if you're promising something, make sure that when they click that they're interested and they land on your website, that you're delivering on that promise by providing the information that you essentially pitched to them in the ad. Uh, and ensure, as my dad said earlier, that the widget is there so that when they do want to submit their information and learn more, that 
there's an opportunity for them to do that. And that would be a huge missed op opportunity if the widget weren't there. So let's talk about some ideas for educational ads. Um, first would be, for example, your capabilities during and post COVID-19. How are you handling things? You're offering virtual consultations. You might be offering virtual appointments. How is your office restructured to be able to manage the post pandemic orthodontic uh, patient? You might want to highlight technology adoption and how it benefits patients. Are those virtual consultations helpful to them? Let's talk about them. Let's see what we can be doing new, differently to, to support patients. Uh, your dental and orthodontic experience, what makes your practice different from the others in your area, um, and, and some other evergreen topics like the benefits of a healthy smile to, to self-esteem. But again, wherever they're when they click on the ad, you want to make sure where they're brought to makes sense because they showed you they were interested on one particular topic when they land, it better deliver. And it's particularly topical now. You know, well, with going through this crisis, we've all made adaptations and patients have adjusted. And, you know, the feedback we get from our clients, and uh, I'd be interested in, in your feedback as well out there, but the overwhelmingly um, positive uh, response from patients when they are FaceTimed by their doctor or texted or any communication that they're not used to, they, they love that stuff and they appreciate it. So, you know, uh, uh, it, uh, digital advertising and, and uh, um, reaching out to this demographic is an opportunity to distinguish yourself as a leader mm -hmm. in this particular field. Good point. Um, this is an example just of, of what, how this works. So on the left-hand side, you'll see there's your, uh, a post that somebody who was in your target audience would see. Um, in this case, we're promoting a smile tune-up. So this is a limited treatment type of program. And they're encouraged to a little pitch, and then they're encouraged to learn more by clicking. When they do, they're brought to, whether it's a page or it's a blog post, essentially it's the same thing, but there's an opportunity at the end for the call to action to start their virtual consultation, which is really important. So that, the, that's the sort of educational side of things. And there's also the lead generation side of things, which is, um, although this is uh, sort of like education to lead generation, they may not click the, the virtual consultation widget immediately, but they may come back later and do it. They're learning more. Here with lead generation, essentially we're driving them to schedule their, their or submit their information for a, a virtual consultation. So here, some tips are to send the virtual consultation ads directly to the virtual consultation page or to the widget, make it simple. And a note that lead gen ads typically do best when you've already spent some time on educating the audience that you want to uh, you know, engage with the virtual consultation widget. So uh, it's a little bit of a two-step process there. So here's an example um, of a lead generation ad. So you know, we're happy to um, introduce virtual appointments, virtual consults, click here or book now for your virtual consultation today and then they'd land on the virtual consultation widget where they could easily tick off a box um, on what they're interested in pursuing with the practice. With Facebook, like I said earlier, you're actually able to choose who it is that you'd like to present your ad to, uh, which is brilliant. Um, you, by using the audience targeting tools available to you from Facebook, you can decide that you'd like to gate the ad so that it only is shown to a radius of 20 miles from your practice location. And that may, that varies widely throughout the country. Maybe it's five miles. So you gate uh, geographically. And then on the right-hand side, you can see there's the opportunity for some detailed targeting um, based on demographics and lifestyle interests. So maybe you're developing a campaign that's talking about um, getting ahead of an upcoming event, like a wedding or something like that, you can say, okay, well, I'm going to specifically talk about this. I want to identify people who are interested in this. So newly engaged pe people, friends of newly engaged people, that type of thing. So that's how we, we're, when we talk about matching up the ad to the, the page, this is how you actually activate on that with the audience targeting. So 
one, one thing to mention is, you know, you can spend a lot of time. This is super interesting. And as orthodontists, you're probably data-driven people and you'd love this. Um, but you can spend a lot of time on this. And in the end, what you'll get is an audience size that's four people. And it doesn't make any sense to target four people. Facebook won't let you. So don't get caught up with all of the details um, of the potential reach. You want to make sure your audience is well-defined, um, you know, the but not too small that it's not going to actually deliver. So a, a narrowly defined audience um, will, will do well for you. And it'll tell you your audience is defined or well-defined when you've hit it. So it's a little bit of titration and trial and error um, when you're in the back end here like this. And a Amy, if I can interrupt a second, yeah. a lot of um, orthos, when, they, when I speak with them, they, they, they ask about boosting. They, think, they, they view boosting as being the equivalent um, it, it, what, it, what is the difference? Are they exactly yeah. the same? No, I mean, boosting is a type of ad. Boosting is a great way for someone who's not familiar with the Facebook advertising platform to power up a post that seems to be doing well or that you'd like to reach other people with. So when you're on Facebook, you'll see on the, the post itself, it'll say boost this post. Um, they're very good about that because they get dollars from you that way. Um, but there is a lot, and you can, you can target your, your people in your area, or you can target your followers, but the opportunity for targeting is much greater when you do it from the back end mm -hmm. of the Facebook advertising platform. So uh, just a quick note about audience targeting. A, a takeaway here is that for budgeting, start with um, you know, almost all of your budget toward education and brand awareness, meaning about the practice and what it does and who are the doctors and, and how you're different and that type of thing. And over time, you can adjust that down and then ratchet up the lead generation part of your campaign. Uh, because like we said earlier, warm leads convert better with lead generation programs. And, and understand that everything we're talking about here is not a quick fix. This is something that, that uh, is a misconception, is that, oh, it didn't work. You did it for a month, it didn't work. You know, uh, the virtual consults don't work because I put it on my website and I'm not, you know, a month later, I'm not seeing anything. Um, you, I'm doing digital advertising, but I'm not seeing the result a month later or two months later, even though I just put the widget on there and, and, and it's just started gearing up. A lot of this takes warming up. A lot of, this is a long-term strategy, um, and you need to be, understand that you need to be part of this if you want it to be successful. Be patient. Make sure all the pieces are in place. We keep tweaking things as marketers. We get feedback. We make adjustments. It's not unlike treating an orthodontic case. We we're constantly titrating. So, um, you know, understand that, that, that just getting something doesn't mean that, you know, uh, yeah, you're going to see immediate results. So let's talk about Google ads, which was the other, other side of the coin with digital advertising. Uh, so Google ads get you in front of new patients uh, when there are certain keywords that they're searching. They allow you to show up, perhaps even when your website doesn't. Um, and it's especially important when your website doesn't. So um, these are, like I said earlier, exclusively lead generation based. They're short, they either power up your existing listing, meaning your website or um, your Google Maps location, or that's just a sentence or so at the top that you'll see that gets people to click and they're moved over to the part of your website that the, the Google ad was promoting. So, you know, matching up again, like what you're promoting and, and where they land on your website is important here too. So a couple of tips here is to be sure that you add tags with uh, call to action verbs for virtual consultations. So for example, you can see here this arrow points to get my free virtual consultation. Make sure that those are in the tags of the Google ad so that they show up there and you can shortcut the uh, person who's searching over to your widget. And make sure that your landing page has the widget on it is the other thing. So that these are two really important things to make sure are in place before moving forward with Google ads. So um, we'll talk about organic social media a little bit um, and its importance. Um, we, we spend a lot of time on organic social media. There is a ton of opportunity on social media to not only inform and educate um, and engage potential new patients 
um, but also to serve as a customer service platform. Be there when there are questions, show that you're alive. During the pandemic, we leaned heavily on social media to be able to communicate with patients. It became almost like the uh, virtual version of the office in a lot of ways, and I think that that's not going away. So social media is really important. Um, posting is good. Uh, engagement, getting people to like, comment, and share is better, um, and making sure that you're there on the receiving end for responses when they ask questions and they do engage, which is community engagement. But there is a very specific use for social media as it relates to lead generation, and this is how we at People in Practice do it. Um, it's fairly simple in that we run promotions, uh, giveaways over time. They don't have to be fancy. Some can be big, some can be small. This is a really simple one. Offer uh, customized sunglasses ahead of the summer. Um, give it a catchy title and at the bottom, make sure there's a call to action uh, to sign up. When they click, again, the ads that we develop, are targeting the people who would make the best new patients at the practice. So not only are they reaching, uh, you should promote this in the office, the patients are welcome to participate, it's good for morale, um, but we're really trying to reach people who are in the community who are not yet patients. That's who the audience is for this as well. So we're trying to get those people um, to participate. And that's a great point, Amy, because you know, we, we have a lot of clients that come to us that have these large numbers of followers, but they're not seeing any production. And of course not. They're preaching to their own choir. I mean, there's value to that. There's value in a lot of ways. But what we're talking about here for lead generation is reaching friends of those people, reaching people in the community that would make good patients in your practice. We're going after new business. Right. Uh, the, the, the traditional Facebook organic posts don't do that. Right. That's a, that's a good point. This is a lead generation strategy here. Um, so the, when they click on that, learn more or sign up or they will be brought over to the website. So again, using the website as the central hub. Um, and when they uh, arrive there, they are asked for, to submit some basic information. So first name, last name, email address, zip code, are you, or are you not a patient? Um, and then they get an entry on the right-hand side. You'll see a con confirmed entry, and they are asked to share this opportunity with a friend, and they'll get extra chances to win if they do. That's how we get a little bit of virality going, so the friend of patient uh, demographic, as well as the ads that are targeting people who aren't yet patients. And you'll see at the bottom of the, uh, the form itself is, you know, the, the are you a patient or are you not? Every question that we ask is an opportunity for segmentation later on so that we can follow up with them um, over time. So what we do is we add them to a lead nurturing database and we send newsletters and opportunities to these people who have entered but aren't yet patients so that we can nurture them along the pathway to becoming a new patient. Um, and that's the goal. So we've got this workable database that we use and we build over time. So the, the next thing that we want to talk about is patient reviews. Um, reviews and also to a large extent, reputation management. Reviews are one part of reputation management, um, but building reviews we know is very important. So um, let's talk about the way to build a review, just basically. There's the anatomy of the ask, just, okay, I heard something good. That's the first thing. I want to thank them for their feedback. Maybe explain the importance of reviews to the practice and then ask them for one. It's, it's super simple, but it's somehow also icky. Um, a lot of doctors are not that interested in doing that. It feels weird, self-serving, staff, it is impossible to get them to do it. Um, True. So that's why, that's why we've developed a program to help work around that a little bit. Um, and it's got a lot of different benefits. So the, the thing that we do now is we ask the doctor and the staff to ask patients for their feedback. So we just want to hear about what's happening at the practice, uh, at what's happening in their head after their visit to the practice. So uh, maybe it's that there's something new going on at the practice and you want to get their feedback. So how are these virtual consultations going? Do you like them? Are there things that we could be doing differently? How are the virtual appointments going? Dental monitoring was recently implemented. How are you doing with that? So it's a good opportunity to just get their feedback. 
So to fill out this simple form, which can be pinged on a phone, on a tablet, on a computer, just, it's just a form, and they get either, depending on your preference, a text or an email invitation to leave their feedback. And then here's the workflow. We, they get a text, they leave their feedback, you know, how many stars did we earn today? Because you'll be asking them a couple of times for their feedback throughout treatment. Would you be open to sharing comments, name, email? And then there's a little bit of a delay there because we're evaluating that feedback. And when it is positive, let's talk about that for a second, they're invited to share their feedback on, on Google, largely. Other, webs, other review sites as well, but largely on Google. Um, but more importantly, I think, is it's also an opportunity to identify any discontent or suggestions or anything that you might want to address on a private platform before they decide to go and leave it on a public platform where it's permanent. So it's an opportunity to, to seriously ask for feedback. In all honesty, you want to know what's happening in their minds, but then it's also an opportunity to screen and identify major issues from people who are as uncomfortable with telling you directly about things that are bothering them as you are with asking for a review. So th this is the simple four-step process. And you'll see here just like an example, the private feedback um, that you get can, can be helpful in informing you about things that you can do a little bit differently. So oh, one more quick question is uh, a lot of orthos would be concerned and staff members saying, well, I don't want to give my cell number out because you're asking me to use my cell phone yeah. to connect. Well, that's a good question. So here on this form, the, it's not the, the cell phone of the patient, of the uh, staff member or the doctor that we're using to issue a text message. This is a form. The text message gets issued here, but not from the staff member cell phone. It gets issued to them and it, it's overwritten um, to look like it's from the practice. So we actually create a little widget that anybody could open Anyone it up. Can open it can open that. on a desktop, the yep. front desk could do it, the yes. staff and the clinical staff could mm -hmm. do it, the doctor could do it, and, and it's just a one, two, three thing, and they go from there. Absolutely. Uh, sharing it to social media. No one's going to know on your, you know, your Facebook followers if you got a Google review or a Yelp review. So um, sharing it through to your Facebook page is a great way to um, capitalize on that goodwill that's being generated elsewhere on the web. So we'll pass it to Carmen Marie for a moment for this open discussion. Yeah, so uh, we just really want to know um, what, how you guys handle feedback. Do you ask your clients for feedback? Um, and, you know, do you, I think this is a great opportunity, especially when you're implementing something new, like if you're new to implementing virtual consultations into your practice, this is a great way to gauge feedback and, and see how you're doing with that. So yeah, just go ahead and answer in the chat um, how you ask your clients for feedback. Greg said that he incentivizes his staff um, to make asks and he says it makes an enormous difference. So Greg, I would love to know um, what that incentiv incentivization looks like. I might have just made up a word. I'm not sure <laughs> I said that correctly, but um, I would love to know how you incentivize your staff um, and, and how that works for you. And then yeah, share your ideas in the chat room. And one, one of the things that, because uh, this comes up a lot and, and uh, you know, we have a lot of different practices that do it a lot of different ways. So I'd be interested in Greg's uh, way as well. But a few ways is, uh, it, you know, uh, putting a certain amount of money into a little jar every time somebody, you know, gets feedback or gets a, gets a review on Google. And when it reaches a certain critical mask and you know, we bring in lunch or everybody goes out. Uh, another way is there's a way to identify a staff member when they give out a review so you can kind of keep people accountable um, in terms of who's doing it. And, and sometimes that helps as well. But the most significant I find is that it has to be a priority from the top. So it has to be constantly repeated. You know, at every morning's uh, huddle, I used to say, look, we need reviews. You know, perception is reality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we need reviews. We get a lot of good reviews. We get patients looking at those reviews and it, and, and it helps us. Yeah. And just one more quick thing is that, you know, in this, in this uh, type of workflow, we're not actually asking for reviews. We're asking for feedback, True. which True. makes it so much more comfortable. And if everybody, if we're on the same page about the fact that no one's going to get into trouble if they collect feedback and it isn't good. True. No. You're going to be rewarded if you collect feedback that isn't good because then we can deal with it and it won't become public. 
True. A really great way to implement social proof. You know, in absolutely. Yep, yep. absolutely. And, and it's a safe way, and 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 it, and and it eliminates a lot of the hesitancy that staff have from moving forward because they're afraid that somebody will leave a negative review. So they go through these mental gyrations. Is that a good patient to ask? Did they have a good experience last time? Should I ask? Shouldn't I ask? And then they don't ask. Right. It's easier uh, not to ask. Before we move forward, I wanted to bring up um, a question that was posed a little bit earlier and, and I didn't want to forget. Um, so as they're in the chat room, I figured it would be a good opportunity. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone asked, how do you quote in virtual consultations without all the data and before getting the treatment plan from Invisalign? Um, and this has kind of been a, a discussion that's been progressing in chat, um, just talking about this. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and let me make something really, really clear. This is not a diagnosis and treatment planning tool definitively. This is an engagement tool, in my opinion. This is a way of engaging a group, bringing them down a funnel, answering a lot of their questions, with the end result being a clinical exam and records and a discussion. Uh, oftentimes, it's, it's just a, a validation of everything that's been discussed before. But the reality is that most experienced orthodontists can probably look at some photos and give a pretty good idea. Can this be treated with aligners or not? Yes or no? Can you give me an idea of how much it's going to cost? 5000 2000 Patients just need to know they're in the ballpark. They need those questions answered. So you may not be able to, to you know, decide for sure whether you're taking out upper fives or upper fours or you know, what, what, the, what the final treatment plan is. And if you have a complex case, uh, be, this is about transparency. We're talking about a demographic that values transparency. The transparency is, hey, you know, 90, nine, nine out of 10 times I could t answer all those questions without any additional records. But you know what? In your instance, I'd like to look at it both ways. I'd like to see if I can get the same result with aligners as I know I could get with braces. I'd like to know if I can get the same result without taking out teeth as I would with taking out teeth. If you come in and we do a scan, I could do, look at those different things and I can give you those answers. So this does not have to be either or. This is just a mechanism to get some questions out of the way that can be handled by your TC, like, does my insurance cover it? You know, TC could check all that out. I mean, they, they, all you need to do is give them an idea of what they're looking at. That's what they're looking for. And they'll keep moving along the funnel as long as you respond to them honestly and transparently. Definitely. Great question, great answer. So, yeah, let's move on. Okay. Um, all right. So let's just talk very briefly here. I know we're, we're short on time at the end here about search engine optimization, which is the last uh, touch point that we wanted to mention today. Um, and that is, and it's an important tool in the toolbox. Um, it is also, I think, sometimes given more credence than it it should only because it you know it feels good to be outranking your competitor in a google search for you know certain keywords your your location and orthodontic but um really people are being driven to your website in so many other ways as you saw that having your website out you know spending a ton to outrank uh your main competitor so that you're number one and they're number two is just um, a very expensive and often challenging exercise where those funds could be going elsewhere to drive more people to your site than you would have if you were above them by one, um, by one result. You know, and the truth is your, your uh, you know, map results uh, show up really high above the organic search results and the ads show up above the organic search results. So um, I am not saying it's not a useful tool. It is for sure, but just keep in mind that it's really part of the puzzle and it should be given a, you know, a smaller share than, than often uh, orthodontists are giving it. Um, so that we can talk about more if you have specific questions there, but I wanted to also just go back here to the, the very beginning slide that, that I brought up and, you know, the, this webinar is about why 97% of 
the visitors to your website are not converting? And the answer is, you know, they're getting there. Um, and the more people that get there, the more will convert. That's just math. But at the same time, you need to make it easy for them to do so. So the widget is super important and having all your bases covered as you drive people to the website and thus the widget is very important to make sure that they don't drop out of this network as they bounce around learning about you. You don't want a leaky bucket as it relates to your digital marketing. So tighten it up, make sure everything's covered, consult widget on your website and, and you're good to go. And, and I can tell you, if you hire a uh, marketing company, whether it's people in practice or anybody else, and you're asking them to help you grow your practice, and you're not providing a virtual consult widget, you are in essence tying one hand behind their back and expecting the performance because it doesn't work well. You need all of the pieces in place for it to work well. The website needs to be optimized, you need the, to optimize the virtual consult widget and you need to have um, a, a either you do it yourself or, or, or an agency like ours that knows the business inside and out that could do it all for you. And I know we've covered a lot of material and maybe gotten into the weeds with some of you, but some of you do it yourselfers that understand what we were talking about. I hope we've given you the content that allows you to even be better at what you do. For, for those of you that look at this and are like eyes are glazed and don't know what to do next, call me because I could help you. Um, and and I'm, I'm offering a, a one hour marketing consultation. Um, just email me at leon at pplpractice.com. Um, also on our website, pplpractice.com, we have a free marketing newsletter where we talk about tips. So if, even if you're a do-it-yourselfer, um, you could learn a lot from our experience. And if you've heard our voices before, <laughs> it's because you probably heard our podcast, The Survival Guide for Orthodontists. And if you haven't, you should download it on, on Apple or SoundCloud or wherever Spotify you get your podcast. Or wherever you get your <laughs> podcast. So again, um, I want to uh, you know, extend our appreciation to our partners today, Smile Snap. Um, Carmen Marie, very, very kind of you to have invited us. And certainly we're available to open it up to any questions. Yeah. Sorry, my kids, of course, at the very end of this, my kids just ran into the door. So. I thought they were my kids. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, we really, um, everyone at Small Snap just wants to, th to thank you guys for doing this with us and collaborating with us um, to put this great content um, to our audience and thank you to everyone who watched live. I know that there are a lot of people that registered who are looking forward to receiving this recording. Um, as you know, doors have opened back up, which is great. And people are getting back to work. Um, and so for anybody who, if, if you have any last minute questions, feel free to ask those now. And I also wanted to take the opportunity, I, I got a, a few messages um, from people who have just started virtual consults and need some help with onboarding and um, getting the widget up. So please reach out to me at marie at smilesnop.com and I will definitely redirect you and make sure that we get you set up with an onboarding specialist and get you going because that is super important to us. So I just wanted to, to say that because I've gotten a few of those messages. Um, but yeah, so let's see, somebody asked, how do you share your Google reviews again? So how do you share those to social media? So that's actually a really simple one. Uh, there are two ways. One is simply you uh, create an, any image you want that says review is here. And then you copy and paste the review from the public you know, platform. If it's a Google review, you paste it into the comment section. Just say, hey, we want to share this wonderful feedback we got on Google. And then you paste it and you have an image and you post it and then you boost it to your followers. That's, that's, the, step, that's the easy answer. If you want to have it go automatically uh, for hyper users who are listening right now. There's a platform called Zapier and you can set it to connect one virtual platform to another virtual platform. So you can say every time that I get a Google review, I want it to go to my Facebook page and I want it to have this image and I want it to contain this information. Zap. Yeah. Zap. And it's a great Zap. way to, um, to kind of throw into your marketing strategy. So weekly, maybe every Tuesday you share a review or you share a testimonial. Right. Um, and so it's, it's another tool, uh, you know, for your marketing team. 
to use to, to have constant content, which is great. So, uh, you know, that's something that I think, you know, everyone can benefit from. So, yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think, I think we're good. I think we were just at two, so perfect timing. And again, this recording will be available to, to you uh, and sent in your email. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Leon. Really appreciate your time and your knowledge. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. Guys. Take care. Bye. Be well.